So I, I want to welcome you all today. Um, thank you again for, for coming out, and thank you also uh, uh, those who've made this possible. I'm thinking, of course, of uh, Roger Hertog, uh, his generosity uh, managed, uh, is, is what made all of this possible, uh, not just this lecture series, but our research program, uh, and a lot of other things as well. Um, thank you to the Arnold Saltzman Institute for co-sponsoring this lecture series and the School of International and Public Affairs. Um, thank you all. And thank you especially uh, tonight to Bob Gallucci for coming out and, and speaking with us. Um, I think you, all of you already know um, that Bob is the president of the MacArthur Foundation. Um, he also was for many years the dean of the Edmund Wall School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. Um, but also, um, tonight, when you think of our subject, um, I think he is uniquely uh, qualified um, to speak to the history and future of nuclear proliferation. Because after all, for 21 years, uh, he served in a series of government positions where he was at the very center of things um, in the evolving uh, problem of, uh, of nuclear proliferation, both vertical proliferation, uh, the way the U.S. and the Soviets were building their arsenals through the 1970s, um, when for a time he was at the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, and also in terms of horizontal uh, proliferation, um, whether it was the, the threat of loose nukes in the former Soviet Union, um, where for a time uh, he worked with the uh, uh, those who are working um, to implement the non-Lugar le legislation, um, but also in, uh, in Iraq, uh, where for a time he was working in the United Nations Special Commission on Disarmament. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I think what we all know him for, uh, which is as the lead negotiator with North Korea uh, in the 1990s and during the, the Clinton administration. Um, so in all these ways, uh, Bob has really been at the center of things, and so he's really uniquely qualified uh, to speak to the present threat of, uh, of nuclear proliferation. Um, so with no further ado, let me uh, turn things over to him and thank him again for coming tonight. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I had a, a number of uh, different ideas about how we would spend our time uh, this evening. That is to say, how I'd spend my part of the time, and then you could ask what you want to ask. And I thought of focusing on one case, like the North Korean case, or the Pakistan case, or the Iran case, or, Iraq case, uh, but um, I thought I'd try something different, um, which is to offer a sort of a framework for uh, how I think you might think about uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Um, it isn't particularly political science-y, as in uh, discipline uh, rigorous, but it, it it, uh, it seems to me that there were three ways of approaching um, uh, proliferation, and I recollect there were three policy responses over years. Now, let me just, some of this is it's my own personal history. I went into government in um, 1974, uh, and you remember the Indians detonated their first nuclear device then. This is not causal. I, did, I didn't cause this. Had nothing to do with it, um, but uh, the structure of my life in terms of the people around me in government seemed to follow these three approaches. Or because I was a student of Kenneth Waltz, I always like using the word image. Uh, you know, taking on delusions of intellectual grandeur here, but uh, th still, at least three three different approaches to the proliferation issue. And I want to describe those to you and, and sort of intellectually where we were and how we have thought about this over the years and then place us now in that context. And then we can have a discussion about the now stuff or the historical stuff if you are interested. Okay. The, the first model, the first image, the first approach uh, is, to the proliferation issue seems to me the inevitably the systemic approach. Uh, it is one that proceeds from the proposition that um, states will inevitably acquire nuclear weapons because the security dilemma defines the essence of the self-help system, which is the international system. States will, to protect themselves, acquire whatever weapons will help them do that for their own self-defense. The image that, that this captures is one of a world, though, therefore, 
over time of many nuclear weapon states. And it does not seem to me to be an accident that when people first were rigorously thinking about the proliferation of nuclear weapons as a major threat to American security and allied security, as opposed to just the Soviet threat, which had dominated our thinking from the late 40s through the 50s, they began to see a world and envision a world that was essentially systemically determined. Uh, and for those who are a fan of the third image of, of Walt, you'd like this, right? Be uh, but beginning with John Kennedy, who famously in the early 60s predicted that by the 70s, in a decade or so, that there'd be 15 to 25 nuclear weapon states. Now, when he made this prediction, there were three, the United States, um, Britain, and the Soviet Union. And then, of course, in the 60s, we added France and China. In the late 60s, the academic who, whose field was proliferation, he dominated, it was George Quester, who, by the way, is still a professor at the University of Maryland and still writing on nuclear issues. And in the late 60s, when I was a graduate student, um, he predicted, again famously, that by the 90s, looking out 20 years, there would be 50 or 50, I say 50 or more nuclear weapon states. And as a graduate student, I, re I actually made a bet with somebody that it wouldn't happen, that it was actually a bet about how many states there would have nuclear weapons in by the mid-70s, because we, we could think that far advanced. That was six or seven years out. And I don't remember the details of the bet, and I never got paid. But I was right. <laughs> um, so what I'm saying to you is that that was the imagery. That was the thinking. It was a view about that this would happen as a result of the character of the international system and the nature of the security dilemma. And it, for evidence, they, we were not thinking then, and I can say we in the late 60s as a graduate student, who I was interested in this topic then, we weren't thinking so much of the most recent states that would be, as I said, France and China, and we certainly weren't thinking of the Soviet Union, the United States, and Britain. We were thinking of, of other states out there and then in 1974, when India in the spring detonated a nuclear explosive device, I claimed it was a peaceful nuclear explosion, if, if none of you here would recall, but that's what they said. This was real evidence that this image, this approach, this model was correct, because we were then politically incorrect, and we called India an underdeveloped country at that point. We don't say that anymore about a country. Uh, we call them developing countries. But they was in, uh, India was then an underdeveloped country, and if in India, if, it, if India could detonate a nuclear explosive device, then we said any state could. Right? Any state could, and any state would. India wasn't particularly under threat. It was a, you know, from, uh, you could, oh yes, they did have a certain China problem, but they didn't have a Pakistan problem. Pakistan had an India problem, but, it, but the asymmetry in forces went in India's favor at the conventional level. So this was driven by something else. And it, what this was driven by was, we argued, um, an inevitable force of the international system, the character of the international system. So that's the first model, and it leads to that kind of expectation about the future. The second model, which I think informed thinking, was n a lot less that proliferation would be driven by systemic inevitability and much more by capability. Those who believe proliferation was probably just as unavoidable as those who took, liked the first model, looked around and saw, this is in the 70s, saw um, the embrace of nuclear energy. If you look back, you will find that the 70s was an enormous growth period, at least in declaratory policy, and actually in, in a fair amount of building as well, in the United States and elsewhere. Nuclear energy was on the move. Not only was nuclear energy on the move, but a particular method of, of uh, 
enjoying nuclear energy, put in that in quotes, enjoying nuclear energy, had taken hold in the United States and I will say therefore internationally. And that was the embrace of the full nuclear fuel cycle. And this is very important and I'm going to now do this. The idea here is that uranium, for the kind of reactors I'm talking about, the United States has 104 nuclear reactors, give or take, and right now we have maybe somewhere between a quarter and a third of all the nuclear reactors in the world still. Largely, they are light water reactors, and that means the neutrons are slowed down by regular water and natural uranium will not sustain a reaction uh, in that light water reactor. So not only do you need to mine uranium, you then need to enrich uranium. And after you enrich uranium and you fabricate the fuel in a fuel fabrication facility, the fuel goes into a nuclear reactor. After the fuel gets burned up, the fuel comes out of the nuclear reactor and it goes in a spent fuel storage pond, which looks to all the world like a swimming pool. Not a good place to swim, but a swimming pool, <laughs> and that's where the fuel is stored. For how long? Well, at least two years. Well, or for how long? 50 years. We still have fuel from our first reactors sitting in storage ponds. That was not the image. This does not look like a cycle to you, does it? It doesn't. But the full, you must have heard the phrase fuel cycle. That's what was embraced, and this is very important to my argument here. Because the next step, according to the nuclear engineers, that not only informed the United States, but we trained. I mean, where did the engineers in India come from who did the India bomb? We trained them at North Carolina State, for goodness sake. So the next step we taught everybody was a reprocessing plant or a chemical separation plant. It's called both. And in that plant, three streams come out. Radioactive waste, uranium, and plutonium. In the dreams of the nuclear engineers, plutonium and the uranium are mixed together and they go into a fuel fabrication facility and mixed oxide fuel is produced, mixed oxide. Not just uranium oxide, which goes here, but plutonium oxide, too. The two are mixed together to form a mixed oxide, and some fuel rods have MOX fuel and some have regular fuel, and they go back into the reactor to be burned. Now you see cycle. Now, why am I taking time to tell you all this interesting stuff? Because if one is interested in nuclear weapons, there are two points in this fuel cycle from which one can get the material for a nuclear weapon. This is one of them, an enrichment plant. As you probably know, the Iranians say that they are in, have an enrichment plant to enrich uranium for their one nuclear reactor, and there are many more than they see in the future. And we observe that that re enrichment plant could be run to produce not just low enriched uranium, LEU, but high enriched uranium. What are they enri enriched in? It's enriched in the isotope uranium-235. And uranium-235 at 85, 90% can be used to make a nuclear weapon. So this is one of the two materials that can be used to make a nuclear weapon. The weapon we dropped on Hiroshima was a highly enriched uranium core weapon. The other material one could use to make a nuclear weapon is plutonium. Where does plutonium come from? It comes from separated spent fuel. It comes out of spent fuel. Plutonium does not occur in nature. It's produced in a nuclear reaction by transmutation in the reactor. It's contained in spent fuel and it sits there unless you have one of these guys. If you have one of these guys, you can get plutonium out. That's the other material to use for a nuclear weapon. And the bomb we dropped on Nagasaki was made from plutonium. So, if you remember what I was talking about before, I was talking about 
capabilities driven model. As long as we thought the world was going to be filled with nuclear energy and we thought nuclear energy was going to be dominated by the full fuel cycle, we thought countries that acquired nuclear energy would acquire a full fuel cycle, would acquire an enrichment plant and a reprocessing plant. As it turned out, we later thought, nah, that's not a good idea. We will sell enrichment services and make money. So let's don't spread around enrichment facilities. But reprocessing, terrific. It also helps for waste management, we argued. Terrific. What about the plutonium? Well, we're going to recycle it back into the reactor. Well, what about if somebody diverts it? will have International Atomic Energy Agency safeguards to make sure they don't divert it. So we had a theory of how this would happen, but anybody who was in the business, and I was at that point in the business in the mid-70s, by that time I was in government, anybody who had worked these issues knew you couldn't really safeguard a large reprocessing plant. The amount of material that would go unaccounted for could be used to make weapons. And this was essentially an invitation, as we argued for this type of a fuel cycle, for catastrophe and inevitability. So we thought in a, in a somewhat the same way but with a different kind of argument that nuclear energy spread would make nuclear weapons spread inevitable. There was of course also the commercial incentive for the sale of reactors, for the sale of all this nuclear technology. A lot of money was going to be made by Westinghouse and General Electric by licensing um, their uh, technologies abroad, one made a boiling water reactor, another made a pressurized water reactor, uh, one went to the French and Framaton built the Westinghouse reactor, the Germans built the boiling water reactor, General, General Electric. So there was a, a, a lot of money to be made in spreading this technology and we spread this technology, light water re reactor technology everywhere. Technology therefore was not just a means, but technology was, was the driver in a way that the, in the first model, the security dilemma was a driver. Okay. Image again would have us see, would have us have nuclear weapons in an awful lot of countries. The third image, the third model, does, did not proceed from an assumption of any systemic inevitability or technological inevitability. It proceeded from an image of the character of states and the character of regions. It, the proposition was that for internal reasons, states might want nuclear weapons, or for regional security reasons. And therefore, the approach and the responses were different. Um, when I was in government, we had, and this is 1976-ish, we're thinking then about a certain set of countries, not all the countries, a certain set of countries which we regarded as threshold. There were 12. We were not politically correct, as I said, so we called them the Dirty Dozen. A movie with Lee Marvin, I recommend it to you. <laughs> this, this, um, this group of countries, there were two in Northeast Asia, Korea and Taiwan. Korea was not North Korea but South Korea, which had a nuclear weapons program. South, uh, South Asia had India and Pakistan. The Middle East had Iran, Iraq, Israel, Egypt, and Libya. Africa had South Africa. And Latin America had Brazil and Argentina. So we saw a, a definite group of countries through our analysis of both the regional dynamic and the internal politics. We thought these were the threshold countries and we focused, if you had this image, when focused on these particular countries. So nuclear weapons were seen in this third image as an expression of a national identity and as necessary to meet regional needs. Be because these models actually are quite different in the assumptions they make about the nature of decision making in states, they led to different policy prescriptions. The first model led to sort of a, a systemic approach. It is what was behind the idea of a nuclear nonproliferation treaty. 
mean, look at this treaty. It's a deal between the non-nuclear weapon states and the five, at that point, at that point, the five nuclear weapon states that would, for all time, read the treaty, legitimize those five states as nuclear weapon states in exchange for their commitment to assist other countries in getting peaceful nuclear technology and for their commitment ultimately to give up their nuclear weapons. A systemic approach. This is one of the most universal treaties on the planet. It has 189 adherents, I think, at the moment, which is very nearly all the states in the world. Along with it, in 1957, came, the treaty was, negotiations were in 68, entry into force was 73. The, uh, along, along around the same period, the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, an entity that would, over time, apply safeguards. Under the treaty, initially it did it through bilateral agreements called Information Circular or IMSR 666, morphed after 1973 into IMSR 153, and every state that wanted to have nuclear energy was required really to make a negotiation, successful negotiation with the IAEA for the application of safeguards to any nuclear equipment they received from another country. So the IAEA inspectors were going all over the world providing a fundamental and essential assurance that the nuclear equipment uh, would be used to produce nuclear material exclusively for peaceful purposes, non-explosive peaceful purposes. So this, this was the character, systemic, right? meant to be universal. Model two, the, the capabilities model, led us some, someplace entirely different. It led us to denial. If you thought technology was the problem, you really weren't going to focus necessarily on the systemic approach of the IAEA and of the NPT. You were looking to deny countries access to sensitive technology. And sensitive technology was a phrase that covered essentially two things, the enrichment plant and the reprocessing plant. If you denied the enrichment plant, they didn't get highly enriched uranium. If you denied your processing plant, they didn't get plutonium. If they didn't get either of those, they didn't have fissile material, they couldn't make a weapon. So the huge effort begun really in 1976 with the creation of something called the London Group, which was six countries and then grew into the nuclear suppliers group of over 40 countries that were dedicated to denying the transfer of sensitive technology to, sens quote, to sensitive regions. And it essentially meant to countries we really, really were suspicious of. So could we transfer this technology to the Dutch? Yeah, that's okay. Do we want to transfer it to Taiwan? I don't think so. Right? So that's how that worked out. It, it took a while to get denial to be accepted internationally, but it, it essentially was. And that was at the heart of the prescription that followed from Model 2. INFCE also, what is INFCE? INFCE is I-N-F-C-E, International Nuclear Fuel Cycle um, E. Thank you. INFCE was like uh, a domestic program, NSAP, which was, which was pursued in the United States. It was an effort to develop yeah, that's not quite right. It was an effort to assess and perhaps promote proliferation-resistant technologies. Proliferation resistance is like uh, what's written on the back of your wristwatch. You know, they don't write waterproof. They write water-resistant. And you couldn't really have a proliferation-proof nuclear fuel cycle but, or, or nuclear technology, but you could have it resistant. And the way you would do that is there are many mechanisms in the fuel cycle that one can uh, um, in introduce that would make diversion, theft, um, or out-and-out -out, um, um, assertion of authority over the fuel cycle, seizure, ineffective. Um, and the idea was to develop more of these type of nuclear technologies. Not tremendously successful in my view, but it was, it was another response that turned on the technical approach. Um, in the United States, the MITRE report that was done during the Ford administration uh, influenced strongly the thinking of President Carter. And when President Carter came into office in 1970, 
76, um, 77 actually, he froze work on the plutonium fuel cycle. So not only, not only did he say that the United States of America would not reprocess spent fuel, he also said that uh, our enthusiasm for something called a um, fast breeder reactor was going to be stilled. A fast breeder reactor is a nifty idea in concept. Uh, it is, as uh, some of you may have heard, that it produces more fuel than it consumes. Doesn't that sound absolutely lovely? Well, what happens is that there is a core of fissile material and then a blanket of what's called fertile material. And some of the neutrons here, instead of producing heat and energy, are used to convert the blanket into more fissile material. And so it's, the metaphor might be if you build a fire, if you've ever gone camping, and you take some wet wood and stack it around your little fire, after a while, you might have more fuel than you started with. Isn't that remarkable? But it meant some of the heat, instead of warming you, warmed the wood. And this is a metaphor to this. Well, Carter ended that. The French went on with breeder development. The Japanese went on with breeder development. The Russians went on with breeder development. Nobody has been successful in, in the last 30 or 40 years. But the idea here, and what I'm really arguing to you, is that this was another expression or manifestation of the second model. The prescription that would come out of it was, let's deal with the technology and make the technology safer. If you were a believer in Model 3, and that's where my career was, um, largely, um, you focused on, in a way, much more traditional diplomacy, particularly bilateral diplomacy. Uh, I would run screaming from the room at the thought that I would be involved in multilateral diplomacy and was much more comfortable dealing with a thug one-on-one. -on -one. That's a much more pleasing and something I understand from having grown up on Long Island. And, and this is a, it's just easier for me to cope with. So if you look around at alliances, for example, I would say alliances, if you view them not just in the terms in which they are negotiated for the security of the state, but view them as a non-proliferation mechanism, they are addressing the security of states that could build weapons for their own security. So, the countries in NATO have the nuclear umbrella. The Japanese, I mean, how long would it take the Japanese to build nuclear weapons if they decided to? I mean, seriously. <laughs> Not long, right? And you know they would be good. I mean, they would be good. <laughs> I mean, they would be small, they'd hum, they'd be, they'd be, they'd be beautiful nuclear weapons, right? So we, we know this, we, but there's the mutual security treaty. Security is met within the context of that treaty. Uh, the Korea, uh, Republic of Korea, same idea. Even Taiwan, even Taiwan. While it's not a formal treaty, we were able to persuade the Taiwanese that because of our relationship with the peoples on Taiwan that uh, nuclear weapons was not a good idea for them. So alliances uh, were part of the policy response here. Traditional diplomacy. You know, when we discovered the nuclear weapons program in, in, uh, in, North, in South Korea, we went over and visited Seoul and we had conversations. And we've done that in other countries where we've discovered the, where diplomacy, sometimes very quiet diplomacy, turns out to be effective uh, in that case. I would say war. Uh, this is a point in the, in the talk where I say let's give war a chance. And uh, if we looked at the Iraqi case, a uh, case I'm very familiar with, a very robust nuclear weapons program that we uncovered after the first invasion of Iraq. Uh, and I would say that six months, a year at most, uh, from the time we invaded Iraq uh, in 1991, that uh, the Iraqis would have had a workable nuclear weapon and a fissile material to make it work. So we blocked that. With, with, with our in invasion. We are not talking about the second invasion, which is a different kind of story. Um, I would also say that you engage in this kind of diplomacy. If you have this model of what drives proliferation, 
sometimes not to solve the problem for all time, but to give other mechanisms a chance. So South Africa. South Africa actually you know, was subject to a lot of pressure from the United States. We discovered the hole in the desert in the Kalahari. Uh, we discovered it with the help of the Russians who said, look here. And we looked there. Uh, and we found them digging this hole. And we said, what's that for? And they said, uh, security. And <laughs> we said, that looks like a hole for the used to explode a nuclear device. And they said, no, no, no. Uh, it was. Uh, we later found out for that, but we knew that it was that. Uh, and we persuaded them not to go ahead. And of course, with the passage of time, the apartheid regime disappeared. And then ultimately, we found out that the South Africans had indeed built six nuclear weapons. And they were dis dismantled, and the fissile material was subjected to IAEA safeguards. So you can actually reverse proliferation. You know, under this model, that's a good thing to happen. Under this model, we spent a lot of time in Brasilia, uh, in, in BA, in Buenos Aires, trying to persuade both countries that uh, nuclear weapons really were not a good idea for Latin Americans. And over time, both of them gave up nuclear weapons programs. Now, it doesn't mean you don't solve this problem for all time, ever, because people don't forget how to do this. But you, this is a, a, an issue that needs constant management. And in this third model, it means constant political military diplomacy. I note, parenthetically, this is of not of interest unless you are a Graham Allison acolyte and you, and I am one, by the way, um, like to look at the processes of government. But we divided ourselves in government according to these three models. I mean, we didn't have the models, and I made up the models afterwards. But um, there was a group that did multilateral diplomacy. You know, they're worried about the NPT, that worried about review conferences, they're worried about the IAEA and all that sort of thing. They were there. There was another group that were essentially nuclear engineers, nuclear physicists, Department of Energy played, the laboratories played, and they were the technology people. And then there were the political military types like myself who had to know about the first two but were really interested in, in mixing it up with individual countries and individual uh, negotiations. So these were really three sets of uh, bureaucrats uh, operating differently for the same objectives. Okay, some observations. Um, how much time do we have, by the way? I have a feeling I'm going oh, on a bit here. Another, you know, at least another 20 minutes, say, or half an hour. How okay. Do you feel? I mean, yeah. All right. Um, some observations. We do not, ladies and gentlemen, have a world of 90 nuclear weapon states right now. We have a world of nine nuclear weapon states. The original five plus four. Uh, with one state, a threshold state. Original five, the United States and Soviet Union and uh, Britain and France and China, the four, Israel, India, Pakistan, North Korea, and then the threshold state now, the threshold state, Iran. This is after 65 years, nine states. Um, that's the first observation. The second is that well, I like the idea of breaking this out into different models. The world, of course, doesn't work according to models. And I think each has some, um, something to contribute to a complex explanation of why things happen the way they do in the international system. So I'm not here to tell you that one model is preferable to the other. But I, I find the phenomenon of proliferation to be complex, the motivations for states to be complex, and policy responses to have to be comparably complex to be successful. Um, third, I am tempted to say policy worked. That may not be right, of course, but I like it because this is what I did for over 20 years. So I like that the, the idea that uh, maybe what we did did some good. But it is undoubtedly true that circumstances changed too over these years, um, it, not the least of which was the chilling of enthusiasm for nuclear energy. Not only did we have Three Mile Island, but there was Chernobyl. And we have not had a reactor start in this country since Three Mile Island. Yes, I know about nuclear renaissance, and I'm going to say a word about that. But I think this is, because of that second image, not a trivial part of the explanation about why we are where we are at this moment. Um, the fourth observation is that the current situation is both difficult and dangerous. 
that leads us to the current situation. To me, briefly, two situations characterize the current um, uh, landscape. The first is the situation in South Asia. If you ask most people that are in the security business, this part of the security business, they will tell you the place where it is most likely that one state would use a nuclear weapon against another state is South Asia. We have two countries with deliverable nuclear weapons with an arsenal. So we have two arsenals. These two countries' arsenals are not enormous, though the Pakistani one is growing. What's the significance of, of it being not enormous? If your model is the US and the Soviet Union and you're thinking, wait a minute, it's good they have nuclear weapons. There, there are those who make this argument. They will deter each other. If, if you're thinking that, think about the requirements of deterrence and think about analytically what characterized in important ways the US-Soviet relationship. You will not find the important features in the Pakistan-India relationship. One of the things you will not find, at least yet, is a secure second strike acknowledged by both sides. Now, will they eventually get there? Plausibly. But right now, you have arguably the worst of anything. You have the possibility of a disarming first strike in one or the other or both mines in, in Pakistan and India. That's very bad for stability and deterrence. Small forces are very bad. Small vulnerable forces are even worse. Neither of these countries have submarine launched ballistic missiles yet. Neither of them have built really hardened silos yet. The delivery systems are aircraft, some missiles. Missiles have some mobility, and essentially they hide things. That's not exactly foolproof. So that's one. Second, I would like to point something out about India and Pakistan that you may not have noticed. They are contiguous. Second thing you may not have noticed, the United States and the Soviet Union, essentially notwithstanding what Sarah Palin has said, are not <laughs> contiguous. What I'm saying is that for all those decades of U.S.-Soviet relations, there were periphery. We had any number of conflicts with the Soviets in which people died, but not directly. There were geostrategic peripheries, Africa, Asia, elsewhere, where things could happen and never engage a vital interest of the others. Why do we all love the Cuban Missile Crisis? A, because we won, but B, because that was so geographically proximate to us, it was plausible that we might actually have a nuclear exchange over it. What I'm saying to you is that India and Pakistan, it's very hard for them to go to war and not engage a vital interest because they're not gonna go to Australia to have the war. They're gonna have it on the territory of one or the other or both. Vital interests will immediately be engaged. That's not a good situation if you're trying to avoid those situations in which the use of nuclear weapons become politically plausible. Third, because they're contiguous, there's an enormous time pressure in a crisis to make a quick decision. It's also exacerbated substantially by the vulnerability of one's own systems, particularly your perception of your vulnerability relative to the other side. If you have to make a decision quickly and you think you're in a, and here's the phrase, use or lose situation, that's bad for stability. So all I'm trying to do here is tell you that this is not um, a happy situation in which you should feel confident deterrence will prevail. There's a, a, a um, ever-present source of conflict for this country, these two countries that have, it, have gone to war at any number of times. That would be Kashmir, of course. And that chronic source of conflict which led to the dismemberment of one of the two states um, is ever present as a possible source of a war that could escalate to the nuclear level. So, South Asia. Second, I would say there is the case of Iran. Um, 
it is possible that Iran will preserve the option to build nuclear weapons but not actually build nuclear weapons. That is a possibility. I consider it more likely that one or two other things would happen, that they will in fact build nuclear weapons or that another state that which could be us will use force to prevent them from building nuclear weapons. That will not be an easy decision. It won't be easy for the United States to watch Iran acquire nuclear weapons because of the implications for the Middle East if it does. And it certainly wouldn't be easy for the United States to use conventional, a conventional strike to stop the Iranians because there would have to be a very protracted strike and you'd have to be planning on restrike because of the character of our conventional capability and the character of the hardening of their facilities. So this is not a happy situation. There's not a, a, a good ending to this that, I, that I, anybody I know of uh, really predicts. Um, and the possibility of uh, the use of force, um, the provocation that these uh, weapons would have in Iranian hands for Arabs, Iranians are of course not Arabs, um, and for the Middle East is, is potentially catastrophic. The third case, of course, is North Korea. Um, we worry about North Korea uh, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which that is that over a period of time the North Korean program could prove to be a provocation to South Korea and or Japan, uh, leading them to acquire nuclear weapons for a variety of reasons, not least of which being domestic political pressure to do so. So these are hard cases. They look like Model 3 to me. Separate solutions, not systemic solutions, not particularly technically driven anymore. Um, much more like uh, Model 3 problems, open to Model 3 solutions if there are any. Finally, my last point here is that the current situation and proliferation is for me not importantly defined by what I have been talking about. It is not importantly defined by the state acquisition of nuclear weapons. For me, our security in the United States and that of our allies is much more likely to be directly affected by the acquisition of a nuclear device by a terrorist group and the introduction of that device into a city for our purposes an American city for your purposes this city it is I hope to get your attention now it is I, to me implausible if we don't do something different implausible that we will get away with 10 or 20 years without having a nuclear weapon detonated in New York City. I say that because I do not see a defense by denial against nuclear weapons acquisition by a terrorist group. In other words, I don't see how we could defend by denial in the classic sense of denying access to our shores. Remember the weapon would, this podium is a nice size for first generation improvised nuclear device. Um, by the way, there are two models here. One, they steal a nuclear weapon. B, they build one. I'm working on B as more likely than A, even though A is a lot more fun for the movies. I like, B is a lot more of more concern to me. That basic device is this, and the question is if you had a weapon that was as big as this podium and you were someplace in Africa or the Middle East or Southeast Asia, could you figure out a way with high confidence of getting it into the United States? Could you figure it out, figure out a way? Or would you be stymied by the extraordinary security at all of our borders? the way our marinas are completely controlled by the Coast Guard so that no ship goes in and out without being searched, the way the northern border of the United States is constantly patrolled, the way nobody ever gets in the southern border. <laughs> no defense by denial. Defense by deterrence. Defense by deterrence against an enemy that values your death more than his life I don't think so. 
So the defense is to prevent this country from acquiring, excuse me, this group from acquiring the fissile material. Well, what's the rub there? The rub there is that there's Pakistan, there's Russia. Neither country wants to, has a leadership that wants to transfer fissile material to a terrorist group. But we know that Pakistan, in many scenarios, will not have a grip on its fissile material. We know that Russia still is not up to our standards in securing its fissile material. Remember, we're talking about, in the Russian case, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tons of fissile material, when an amount of material that would fit in that bottle would give you Nagasaki. And in this city would give you, at a ground burst, at noontime-ish, would give you on the order of a quarter of a million people dead, some of them promptly and some within four to six weeks. I'm not talking about long-term radiation here and that. That's, we were stunned as we ought to have been by 9-11, 3,000. And I'm talking a quarter of a million people. The, for me, we should recast the Iranian case, the North Korean case, those cases are to me, even though I just spoke to you in terms of proliferation, the domino effect in the region, that's not what they're really about for me. I know I don't live in New York, I live in Chicago, my daughter lives here, and I like the people in New York. <laughs> but it's about the transfer of material. And before you say, oh no, now you are talking about some TV show, 24, who's gonna, what country, I've been actually in debates, what country is gonna transfer who? Well, did, did you miss the story about North Korea building a plutonium production reactor in Syria? Did, you, did that one blow by you or did you notice? Do you know what a plutonium production reactor is? It's one of those reactors that is not built for energy. It, that's why they call it a production reactor. It's, we built in the United States at Savannah River and a few, couple of other places reactors not for energy purposes, but for plutonium production, hence the plutonium production reactor. That's what the North Koreans built in Syria. And we didn't catch them at it. And you're going to catch a bottle being transferred? I don't think so. I don't think so. And what would possess them to do it? To make money. They're hungry. I'm not now seeking sympathy for North Korea. I'm just making a point. I'm not, uh, please, as Dave Barry used to say, I'm not making this up. Please check it out. The Israelis did destroy that one site. But there, that is, to me, proof positive. And by the way, for all the extraordinary red line drawing of the last administration, we did absolutely nothing after that happened. Would you like to be dependent on Syria's decision making over the disposition of the plutonium at their secret plutonium production facility? Would you like to depend on Iran's? Iran right now supplies more conventional weapons to groups that we regard as terrorists than any other state on the planet. And they're on the edge of producing fissile material. I, I take this all very seriously. And now, if this doesn't catch your attention, try my closer. We are in the midst of what many people in this country, including the President of the United States, an honorable man, and the Secretary of Energy, another honorable man, and everybody senior in this administration, many of them I have known for a long time, not all of them, but some of them, in the midst of embracing a nuclear renaissance, that may well include the use of plutonium fuels. Because, because, they are describing the terrorist threat as the principal threat and the material for a terrorist threat to be only highly enriched uranium. bomb design number one.
Imagine that's a sphere. Imagine these are high explosive lenses. Imagine there's fissile material here. This makes what's called an implosion system. Com these explosives compress this material till it is supercritical and you get a nuclear yield. That was the Nagasaki bomb. This is another design. This is fissile material, and in fact, it is HEU. Everybody in the administration who works on these issues has been taught something, which I will now teach you. There are, only, there are two basic designs for a nuclear weapon. This design is the simpler of the two. This is essentially a tube. Conventional explosive at one end, detonated and high explosive, and excuse me, and fissile material goes down the tube, hits the other, and you get a supercritical mass, and you get an explosion. This was the Hiroshima device. This produced about 12,000 tons of TNT equivalent KT. This is in Nagasaki, produced around 18 uh, KT. You can only make this device with highly enriched uranium. This device, called an implosion system, can be made with either plutonium or highly enriched uranium. You all with me? A terrorist, it is said, cannot make one of these. Too hard. Terrorists can only make one of these. But one of these can only be made with HEU. So if we can control HEU, we have controlled the terrorist threat. And we don't have to worry about plutonium. This it's technical nonsense. It is in every book that I have ever seen about nonproliferation. It also is informing the thinking of the administration, as best I know. It's at least informing some thinking. It is a great concern to me that we treat plutonium with the same respect and care and awe that we treat highly enriched uranium. There is a blue ribbon panel established by the President of the United States, chaired by Brent Scowcroft, former National Security Advisor, and Lee Hamilton, now with the Woodrow Wilson uh, Center. Uh, and that, that panel will make its report on re reprocessing plutonium use by the United States. will make their report, uh, I believe, in December or January. Uh, it's very important um, that that report reflect concern about plutonium. And I certainly hope it does. So what I'm telling you here, the bottom line, is that if we end up with plutonium fuels because of this kind of reason, then we, plutonium will be in circulation at every reactor. So think about that. Where are reactors? You don't build reactors in the country. You build them in the cities, right? That's where you need the energy. So wherever you have a reactor, you will have plutonium in motion. It will be in fuel. Not a good thing. Not a good thing for the United States, but certainly there'll be reactors all around the world. There'll be a lot of plutonium. A lots of plutonium be separated and in motion. This is a very bad idea if you're trying to control it. There will be arguments that there are ways of reprocessing so that the plutonium stream contains some fission products and byproducts, which will make it very difficult to handle if you're a terrorist and therefore not useful for a weapon. If you stay interested in this, I invite you to scrutinize those arguments very carefully. I think I should stop right here. It does look like it's 7 o'clock, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs> All right, Bob, thank you very much. Uh, those who'd like to pose questions, I invite you to uh, step up to the, the microphone at the center here. Um, I think I might uh, abuse my position here and, and ask you the first question. Um, on the way over here, you were talking about how when you um, became president at the MacArthur Foundation, you found that you could learn about all kinds of things besides nuclear proliferation. And um, the, the question I have is, uh, you know, given that, um, yeah, the MacArthur Foundation is working in all different fields. Uh, how would you assess the challenge and the threat of nuclear proliferation 
relatively to the other kinds of threats and challenges um, that we face. And I, and I ask that you know, because uh, we have a lot of students in the audience here. And you know, when you talk to students about things that they care about, they get excited about, they get active about, they, they get excited about things like climate change, like public health, and so on. And it's a relatively self-selective group that gets interested in, in the challenge of nuclear proliferation. Are these students wrong? Do they have the wrong priorities? How would you assess nuclear proliferation relative to some of the other things that we should care about? Every graduation speaker cannot resist telling the youth that's before them to follow your passions. And it's unfortunate that it's a cliche, but you know things become a cliche for a reason. Uh, it's almost irresistible for uh, certainly for an old guy to say to you, uh, follow your passion. Um, I am the president of a foundation that has an incredibly broad menu of areas of work uh, reflecting um, these broad values of concern for the human condition. Uh, so we're in to domestically to um, education K through 12. We're into community building and uh, reduction of violence and creation and preservation of low-income housing or into juvenile justice reform. Uh, I, I could go on and on about the domestic stuff we're doing internationally or into human rights and international justice, maternal mortality and other issues of uh, human productivity and health. Uh, we are trying to advance higher education in certain selected places. Uh, and, and we're interested in international security, broadly defined, including this area. Um, I have devoted a fair amount of my career to political mi military issues in the national security of the United States and international security, and I have never been bored uh, doing that, and I was always confident that the work would never get done, but I always thought that I could make a contribution um, and that it was extremely important. Uh, I could imagine now, particularly that since I've moved to the MacArthur Foundation, uh, being able to get comparably interested in any of the areas I just mentioned. Uh, when I, what is it, you might wonder what the president of the MacArthur Foundation does all day. I, essentially, I listen, uh, you know, and I get briefed, particularly, and this was, I'm just finishing my first year, so I, the quality that I have a tight grip on is ignorance. <laughs> uh, I, and so I, I'm listening to all these experts in the foundation who have worked these issues all their lives tell me about the issue. And then my job is to really go out uh, with them, the staff, to visit the grantees, the people. We, we're not an operating foundation. We give money. Or we, that's what we do. We give money away to uh, the civil society, to, to the NGOs and international organizations that advance our values and our interests. Uh, so it might be a group that's um, you know, reducing maternal mortality in Nigeria or India it might be a uh, school system in, in New York as you know I'll be tomorrow I'll be visiting some of the grantees in the city where we're working on digital media and learning and uh, with um, one of your schools in particular uh, so I get to see the grantee that's working there and I also get to see the people we're trying to impact whether it's kids in in uh, seventh grade or whether it's women in, in Nigeria or whether it's one of our conservation projects in Madagascar, and I can get pretty passionate pretty quickly about saving species um, in uh, all around the world. We operate on hotspots, but I feel passionately about all those issues. This is the one that I picked, but um, I'm not here to tell you that uh, it is superior in any moral or ethical way to a lot of other things you can do. And as I used to say as a closer when I was a dean at Georgetown and was always looking to raise money for my school, please, some of you go into financial services because I need <laughs> gifts. <laughs> you know, that part of my life is, is apparently over, uh, so I'm not saying that anymore, but um, one can do good in a lot of different ways. Uh, certainly, um, when I look at the menu of the MacArthur Foundation, I'm struck by the dozens of ways one can. Okay, thank you. So, Paul. Um, when, when people talk about the possibility of a, of a nuclear intervention, I'm sorry, a military intervention against Iran, 
one thing that's frequently brought up is the idea of Israel acting alone. Is that at all feasible? Does Israel have military capacity to conduct a, as you described, the multi-day protracted repeat operation in a situation where the United States was actually against it? I think I, all I want to say about that is this, that whatever capability Israel has to launch a strike against Iran to destroy its nuclear facilities, that ability and that capacity is less than what the United States has. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, the ability of the United States to do that is limited. I don't mean that we couldn't really ruin their day, but I don't believe that stopping the program is a plausible outcome from even a series of strikes over a series of days. One would have to contemplate restriking to a period of time. Iran has been aware that the program might be subject to attack and has put facilities underground. So um, the problem facing the United States is even more acute for Israel, who regards the Iranian program as, as they say, an existential threat. Okay, Nick. Hi. Um, uh, I was wondering first if you could offer your thoughts on uh, evaluating the relative risk of nuclear terrorism today versus in, say, like 1985 or at the fall of the Soviet Union, and second, um, uh, to what you attribute those differences in the risk level, um, be it like the change in nature of terrorism or what you sort of see. Yeah, I, I frankly was not thinking about nuclear terrorism in 1985, um, but I, it would seem to me that given the way I think about it these days, which is in terms of the availability of fissile material and of people interested in that kind of terrorism, and these are, these are the two th factors I would point to in response. Uh, there are books on my shelf, and I imagine the shelves of others in this room, that talk about terrorism, and they mean something different than the terrorism we now have. They, they, it used to be said that <clears throat> terrorists want a lot of attention, but not a lot of people dead. That if too many people die, since terrorism is a political act, it can be politically alienating and therefore counterproductive. So the idea of a, the terribly lethal um, virus uh, being spread by a terrorist or a nuclear weapon being used by terrorists seemed to be inconsistent with the idea of the objective of any terrorist group who was seeking sympathy for their cause. That style of terrorism has been overtaken by another kind of terrorism and so with often with an apocalyptic view of the world, Om Shinriko comes to mind in the Japanese case, or Al-Qaeda in our case, where um, there are documents um, that show Al-Qaeda having made a calculation about the numbers of thousands of American innocents who could be killed quite legitimate, legitimately in light of the numbers of deaths of Muslims caused directly or indirectly by U.S. policy over the years. So there's um, a kind of a sort of a just cause argument being made, and I put that in heavy quotes, that phrase just cause, um, by some um, uh, Muslims. I don't, I don't believe this is mainline uh, Islamic thought, and please don't don't think I'm making that case. What I am saying is that I think most of us who have looked at this believe that were Al-Qaeda to succeed in manufacturing or otherwise acquiring a nuclear weapon and introducing it into an American city, it would not hesitate to detonate it. So the first thing that's different from 1985 is this kind of terrorism. The second thing is if you're I have been talking about nuclear terrorism, not biological terrorism. I will say that in the model that I'm most concerned about, <clears throat> fissile material availability in the 
construction of an improvised nuclear device that there is more nuclear material around these days than was around um, 30 years ago um, <coughs> or 25 years ago. So I, I think that the threat is greater now than it was then. Harrison. Historically, what do you think were the longer term implications for the policy of denial during the 1970s? That's, um, that's a great question because at the time, you might guess that some were arguing that denial would be provocative, that uh, we would do better uh, if we would allow access to this technology under the right circumstances, which meant international safeguards. Um, I don't believe that to be true myself. I'm remembering the, um, how hard we fought to persuade the French and the Germans not to build, and the Italians, not to build or contribute to the construction of um, enrichment or reprocessing plants in, and let me list cases, Pakistan, and North Korea, South Korea, um, Iran, uh, Brazil, Argentina, uh, I could go on. And I think the policy of denial behind it, an argument that there was no good economic rationale for reprocessing or enrichment. There is a, there was then and is now a market in enrichment. So if you are a utility in Sweden and you, you're looking to get some enriched uranium fuel for your reactor, you can go to Urenco in Europe, you can go to Eurodif in Europe, you can go to Russia, you can go to the United States, maybe soon you can go to Japan. So you, there's a market and you can get the best price on uranium and the best price on enrichment services. For reprocessing, the argument goes that there is no economic argument right now for reprocessing. There might be one eventually, depending on the price of uranium. I, what I didn't explain here is that there, we, the reason why countries might want to recover the plutonium is that plutonium is a fissile material, which means it fissions with fast or slow neutrons, like uranium-235, the fissile isotope of natural uranium. And so when you have plutonium, you can replace the uranium-235 that you would have increased in content in proportion in, in the uranium for the fuel of a low enriched reactor with plutonium and therefore you would need less uranium and you wouldn't need as much in the way of enrichment services. So there's fuel value in the plutonium but it's very hard to make an economic case that it makes sense these days until the price of uranium and enrichment services change. That's very contentious and people will disagree with that proposition. Okay. Gus? Um, given in the past couple of years the surge in concern about climate change and especially with the BP oil spill and all this talk that, you know, oil is, is our addiction to oil is not sustainable. I was wondering if you thought that was a real threat and if so, is nuclear energy going to be a part of the solution? Um, and if not, what are the other, you know? Solutions. Yeah, I, I'm enough of an expert on this stuff to know I'm not an expert on this stuff. So I'll tell you what I think, but uh, you know, it's sort of a word to the wise here. I don't believe that um, at least now you can have a serious um, energy policy that is sensitive to our concerns about carbon fuels and climate change that does not include nuclear energy in the mix. You may be surprised to hear that I'm an advocate of nuclear energy. I am. I am a death on wheels to the use of plutonium fuels, but uh, to nuclear energy, the way we have been using it in this country with the, what's called a once through cycle, it stops at the pond and then maybe goes into dry storage in a cement cask. That's what we do in you know, sort of my neighborhood around in Washington. That's what happens to the fuel. It goes into dry storage where it can stay for a couple hundred years, quite happily. And, and that seems to me the way to go. That's a good, ra to me, a good radioactive waste management solution. It doesn't require us to use Yucca Mountain. 
and the President doesn't want to use Yucca Mountain. So this all makes a lot of sense to me, and nuclear energy makes sense as part of the mix. Is it better to do other things so you don't have to have the concerns that at attached to the use of nuclear energy, the certain risks that are different? Yes. Um, yes, alternative fuels, and principally efficiency, increasing energy efficiency, and conservation. There's an awful lot of energy that could be saved there, and I'm very enthusiastic that not only that can happen, but it will happen, not because we all turn green because we're wonderful people, but for economic reasons. And I think we will be using less oil over time. But I think um, in right now when we talk about a mix uh, for most countries, nuclear energy should play a part. The French get someplace between 80 and 90 percent of their electrical generating capacity from nuclear energy. That's a lot. We're around 20-something percent, which is non-trivial. Thank you for a great talk. Um, <clears throat> regarding your Model 3, I don't know how many people here are aware <coughs> of the fact uh, how much energy and effort you put into bilateral diplomacy with North Korea uh, over a number of years. So uh, I kind of want to put you on the spot and put the spotlight on that part of your career. Um, as you reflect, um, do you believe the North Koreans were sin really wanted to carry out the agreement that you negotiated, the agreed framework? Um, that's first part of the question. Second part is, um, to what extent do you fault the diplomacy of the successor administration that you didn't serve in for the fact that we're in this uh, impasse today? And how do you see it playing out if you looking into the crystal ball? How do you see this crisis resolving itself? Thank, thank, you. thank you for that. Uh, I am, of course, completely objective on this subject, and you should trust everything I say. Um, uh, we never knew when we were negotiating with the North Koreans whether, A, we would get a deal, and if we did, whether they would stick to it. And in retrospect, um, I still don't know the answer uh, to the second question. Obviously, we got a deal called the Agreed Framework. At some point, you know, the deal was concluded in 1994. So at some point between 1996, 97, and 1999, it is pretty clear that the North uh, got into a kind of arrangement um, with Pakistan and received from Pakistan uh, some gas centrifuge machines, maybe more, but that's at least, what I just said is, at least that is true. So one is tempted to say, well, they made the deal, but they did not abide by it. It would be, it, it, I'm not the lawyer for the North Koreans, Lord knows, but if I were going to say, how could this have happened, this might have been North Korean hedging because they didn't get what they thought they were going to get and they might have reasonably expected, which was a political relationship with the United States. You may or may not remember what happened in the fall of 1994 in addition to the conclusion of the agreed framework. One of the things that happened is that the Democrats lost both houses of Congress. And all of a sudden, when I went up to the Hill to talk about my negotiations with North Korea, instead of some fairly friendly and supportive Democratic chairs of subcommittees, there were a whole lot of people who really didn't like this deal at all. Uh, and we're thinking of undoing it, but we're worried about the implications of that. What I'm saying is there was no enthusiasm for the political part of the deal with North Korea. The North Koreans felt that we welched on that. I, I don't think whatever welching we may or may not have done was material, as a lawyer might say. What they did in their cheating clearly was. Would they have continued to pursue this had the Gore administration proceeded with the negotiation that was planned at the end of the Clinton administration. Who knows? In any case, this last part of your question, was I unhappy with the Bush administration's treatment of North Korea uh, in September of 2002? And the answer is yes, I was. I really thought that um, we could have valued the freeze we had with the North more than we did instead of taking a position uh, which insisted that they um, own up to this enrichment program before we ever talked to them anymore, 
which made it very unlikely, if not inconceivable, that negotiations would continue. And then the North, after we did that, they claimed that we had broken the deal and they went off on their own way, tested nuclear devices, produced more plutonium, and it has not been a very pleasant history ever since. All that being said, you might notice that the President has been the President now for almost a year and a half or so, and we have not had peace and light with Pyongyang. So these are tough people to deal with. Um, looking ahead, I think, as I always used to think, there's a way to get into a negotiation with them that we could come out ahead in. That negotiators have to think this way. Um, you have to keep your eye on the ball and the national security, but you have to be pretty optimistic that you could pull something off. So I think there is a deal still to be made with the North. Uh, it wouldn't be easy, and they're not chomping at the bit right now for whatever reason. So I'm, I'm not, I don't regard the North Korean case as, as critical as some others that we confront because they're, right now the principal concern I have is A, transfer, and, and B, the domino effect. Intrinsically, I don't think the North Koreans are going anywhere with their nuclear program. Thank you. Thank you very much for your speech. You sometimes we hear the phrase, you know, we're, we're fighting the last war, and Model One, Two, and Three sort of has some component of that. But the issue you brought up with the non-state actors—that's today's war, tomorrow's war. You raise the issue of HEU controlling that as one of the ways to to win that war. But I was wondering if there were other things that you have and that you like that you could address of other ways to control sure. whether it involves finances or not. Uh, if you get interested in this topic, um, looking here at students, you would go back over what I said about no defense and no uh, deterrence. And one of the things you'd get interested in is: is it possible, in fact, to recreate some deterrence, or maybe to use a, a shelling word, compellence? And some of us have been attracted to the idea that we might be able to find out if there was a nuclear detonation, who did it? Not only who did it, but who provided the fissile material. We might want to do that because if we could do that, we could announce that we could do that and we could in fact issue a sort of, well, let's call it a threat. And uh, it would be one that we'd have to be very careful with because this fissile material could come from places that have nuclear weapons like Russia or Pakistan, places that we do not believe would on purpose transfer, but places that maybe have not been as rigorous as we might like in controlling that material. Now, all this chain of reasoning depends upon the proposition that we could in fact say to the world, if you detonate a nuclear weapon, on the territory of the United States or one of its allies, we will find out who did it and where the material came from. That is called attribution. It's the ability to attribute. And uh, you may or may not know this, but your government is working pretty hard at, on the problem of attribution. And I can tell you that if a nuclear weapon does go off in your city or in my city, um, in addition to the uh, many people that would come to help us all out, there'd be some group of folks who would come uh, probably wearing uh, white suits like in the movies, and they would not be coming here to help y'all. They'd be coming here to collect debris. And they would scoop up that debris and they'd take it back to the Department of Energy laboratories like you know, Sandia, Los Alamos, Livermore. And they would do an isotopic analysis to try to figure out first it was the core plutonium, or was it highly enriched uranium, or whatever? Uh, what was the design like? Um, and a lot of other stuff. And could we actually find out where the plutonium was produced? In which reactor? In what country? Could we figure out what the technology was used to enrich uranium? Was it centrifuge? Was it diffusion? So there are people who are working on that capability so that we could say that. In fact, we could say now. I can say now to you that it's possible we could figure this out. That's not as powerful as a statement as we might want to make over time. So one of the avenues that we're pursuing is the idea of recapturing a little bit of this deterrence. It's, it, it's really, as I say, more compellence in the case of, for, to adopt good policies. But in the case of North Korea, if North Korea believed that were they to transfer anything, 
we would trace it back to them and treat them as though they were the attacker, we might create a little deterrence out of this. So that's one possible. Stephen. Uh, thanks very much. I uh, have a question um, about uh, the idea, well, about the, the uh, horrible scenario you sketched out for us. Uh, is, is the problem nuclear terrorism or is it Al Qaeda specifically getting nuclear weapons? Uh, that is, it seems to me there are a lot of terrorist groups that exist, that a lot of them we don't think would have an interest in acquiring nuclear weapons, or at least if they did, in detonating it on U.S. soil. This seems to be specific to um, groups with a global reach that don't have much regard for their own survival, that aren't seeking specific, uh, concrete, proximately obtainable uh, political goals, Al Qaeda is the, it seems to me where that's what we're talking about. Uh, so is this a forecast then that would depend upon the uh, continued uh, success of Al Qaeda, or is this a broader issue than that? <coughs> and let me just add to that if you want to. Uh, how much interest has Al Qaeda shown in acquiring a nuclear weapon? Okay, as they say in California, way broader. Um, think Oklahoma City. Suppose I told you instead of this fertilizer-based gas-enhanced explosion that took down the Mirtha building, that they had access to a nuclear device that produced subkiloton yield, so maybe half a KT. Now, KT is a thousand tons of TNT equivalent, so this would be 500 tons of TNT equivalent, which would be um, order of magnitude or more bigger an explosion than they got. Do you think they wouldn't have done it? I have no reason to think they would have said, oh, no, that too many dead people. I only want to kill this many dead people. I don't get that. I, I get apocalyptic. And the same thing with Om Shemiko. Om Shemiko, I don't know how much you know about these folks. They, this was not Al-Qaeda, but this was, they had they were scouting uranium all over the world. I mean, they were well financed. They uh, attempted the... Uh, anthrax thing, failed at it. Uh, they killed people uh, before they hit the subway with people at a little party they went to. So uh, clearly they wanted massive death. So I don't see this as Al Qaeda specific. It is just, it's irresistible when I'm talking about this not to think about an Al Qaeda group or a branch group because they have a particular hatred for the United States and a belief that the United States has been behind so much death and destruction in, in, uh, uh, in the Arab world. But by no means is it limited to Al Qaeda in my view. Second, if you, the second part of your question was, but do we have specific knowledge that Al Qaeda has been after nuclear weapons? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, we have a couple of, I don't want to say funny as in hilarious, but the, uh, a couple of Pakistani scientists from the nuclear program showed up with designs for a nuclear weapon in Al-Qaeda caves in Afghanistan, and we got the designs. They're awful, but you know these were people from the nuclear program, not clearly from the nuclear design program, but from the, from the nuclear program, which is quite large in Pakistan. So we know that. We also know that Al-Qaeda has advertised, I mean this, they've advertised for nuclear scientists. So, uh, I, you know, they could be wanting to build a peaceful nuclear plant, but I doubt it. Um, so I, I don't think there's any question about Al-Qaeda's interest in this. And, uh, but I really do mean this is a terrorist issue. When I talk about 10 or 20 years, I'm just trying to get you to think about, not that it, 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 it hasn't happened yet, maybe it won't happen, but this does not go away. 
And anything we do that exacerbates the problem, such as, in my, from my perspective, use plutonium fuels, increases the likelihood. Whatever the chance is that it's going to happen this year, multiply it out over 20 years or even longer. And it becomes a very troubling phenomenon. Thank you all very much. Thank you. So uh, we're, we're taking next week off in our series, but please uh, join us again two weeks from tonight at the same time, same place for Philip Zelikow. Thank you. <laughs>